to the CNI Digital Scholarship Planning webinar series. And if you've participated in previous sessions, welcome back. I know many of you are working from home and some of you are back on campus. I hope you're all doing well during this difficult time of the pandemic. I'm Joan Lippincott, Associate Executive Director Emerita of CNI, and I'm moderating the nine sessions of this series. If you've missed some webinars or would like to rewatch or share the presentations, we have recordings available for the first seven sessions, as well as a set of questions to guide planning discussions on your campus. We have two speakers for this session and we'll take questions after each. Please type your questions in the chat box at any time. In addition, after the formal one hour session is over, we'll open the mics in case some of you wish to verbally ask questions of the speakers. The chat box is also available to communicate with each other or with me or our technical lead, Beth Sechrist. During the presentations, all participants will be muted. For this eighth session, our presenters will discuss spaces and places that are used for digital scholarship programs and activities. While we've heard about the restrictions of use of space during previous sessions due to the pandemic, I believe it's important to think about space planning now in preparation for healthier times. I'm pleased to welcome our presenters today, Greg Rashke, Senior Vice Provost and Director of Libraries at North Carolina State University, and Brian Sinclair, Associate Dean Public Services at the Georgia State University Library. Their bios are on the webinar site, and I won't take any more time with introductions in order to give our speakers more time. So over to you, Greg. Thanks, Joan. I really appreciate um the invitation uh, and the opportunity to join everyone. I, I appreciate everybody's time. I'm realizing more and more with a, as much time as I spend on Zoom that uh, that an hour of folks time on Zoom is a, is a valuable asset. Um, so it's my pleasure to be here and thanks to Brian for, for joining me in this effort. Um, so as Joan mentioned, right, we're, our focus is to talk about uh, space and place, which is kind of an interesting um, timing in terms of doing that. I'm currently in our, our DHL Library, one of our two main libraries, um, and we're at about 10% capacity. We're open, but we're at about 10% capacity, uh, and we have a, almost no researchers in the building. That 10% is almost totally students, so almost all of our digital scholarship activities um, have moved into to digital realms, um, but like Joan, I am supremely confident that um, that the past and the future tells us that investments in these kinds of spaces are going to be important. They're going to pay off. Uh, they are transformational, um, and we can use this time to, to plan and set ourselves up well for, for, as Joan put it, healthier times. So the story I want to tell you a little bit about today is um, how we aim for and how uh, we try to embody a quote from a, a recent quote from a professor here at NC State, um, Dr. Paul Fife. He's a professor of English. He recently said about the libraries, uh, the the NC State University libraries, that we've been more than a service provider, even more than a collaborator and partner, but we have expanded his idea of the possible. So I want to tell you that brief story of how we, the spaces, the services, the programs, the expertise that we've kind of packaged together around our spaces and our transformations um, have helped us go from a service provider to an expander uh, of the possible, as Paul put it, and I, I promise I didn't pay him um, to say that. Um, Okay. So uh, the broader context for us, that's, um, we have two main libraries. Um, we have, uh, that's the James B. Hunt Jr. Library, which opened in 2013. Um, and we have renovated our other main library, uh, which I'm sitting in our Hill Library. We renovated it in 2007. Um, then we, and th those spaces were largely focused on student oriented learning commons, study rooms, those kinds of things. We built the James B. Hunt Jr. Library, which has a, a myriad of digital scholarship oriented spaces. In a sense, the whole building is a, is a digital scholarship interdisciplinary kind of crossroads. That's the way we envisioned it uh, with multiple spaces. And I'll show some examples um, from that building. Uh, and we've also uh, just opened this fall a new space, um, a, a new renovation, a second renovation of our old main library, the Hill Library, which I'm in. Um, so part of the theme that I want to mention is as you start renovating spaces and you start 
demonstrating and showing value, I think the investment in those spaces continues and the campus kind of, rather than a one shot and you're done, what happens is there's a momentum and an ecosystem and a culture that develops around these spaces that keeps pushing them forward. And the transformation of those spaces and the associated technologies provide significant opportunities to kind of fundamentally change um, and, and engage the relationship between researcher, faculty member, student, and library. Uh, it gives us opportunities to foster creative models of research, teaching, and learning, and the combination of high technology spaces, good design, flexible learning environments, and librarian expertise, staff expertise, um, has fostered an experiential environment here and elsewhere um, that faculty and students can leverage to, to enhance the, the research enterprise, their digital scholarship activities, their educational experience um, at their universities. And, and fundamentally what's happening, I think, is the relationship between library space and the user uh, is changed. And the spaces are the most tangible and symbolic and forward example of that evolving relationship. But if done right, the theme I'm going to uh, hit on is that they're only the beginning. There's a lot more to it. Um, new spaces provide the opportunity for that fundamental change uh, in relationship and engaging digital scholarship and experiential learning. But um, it's actually the things that, that follow on those spaces, that build on those spaces um, that I think have the biggest payoff. So there's several opportunities, right, uh, in association with, with new spaces, transform spaces. Re as I mentioned, reconnecting faculty and students with the physical library in, in different forms um, and a chain of engagement and creativity that I think is uh, unparalleled in the, in the time of libraries. We can incubate emerging technologies that aren't easy to find. We can provide things that, that, that can't be provided in other venues on campus. Uh, enhanced hands-on learning and engagement, creative pedagogy, we can be a showcase for student and faculty work, which I think is really interesting and, and sort of underutilized uh, idea um, and become a platform for programs and workshops for bringing community members together, for bringing people together, multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity. Um, and it can be an important signal of the library's emergent role uh, and roles in the research enterprise, um, especially if the spaces, again, as I mentioned, that that are provided are, are unique or rare on campus and provide value for researchers uh, in ways they can't get anywhere else. And I think the most significant opportunity is the creation of an experiential library for experiential learning and research um, as the core delivery mechanisms of collections and even basic research services and curriculum and foundational learning move online become asynchronous, those kinds of things. The library space becomes a platform for that deeper learning, that deeper research experience. Um, and then it also allows the library to become a partner in delivering research infrastructure again in a way that I don't think um, we've had the opportunity to do before. And working across the life cycle of digital scholarship and research uh, in a much broader, deeper, um, uh, and profound way. Um, I'll, I'll run through some examples relatively quickly, um, try to make sure we save our time for some discussion, uh, but this will give you an example of some of the spaces that we've been able to provide, the types of projects that we've been able to do. Uh, one, and I know Brian's going to talk about this, uh, is immersive pedagogy and research using large-scale video walls. Um, the James B. Hunt Jr. Library, which I showed, has several um, large-scale wall immersive environments. Um, the intro slide I had has a, is a 360 kind of immersive projection environment. Um, and it's opened up several opportunities for our faculty. Uh, the, the folks pictured here are an English professor, a computer scientist, and an architecture professor who got together to do a virtual Martin Luther King project to uh, recreate um, a speech that he gave in Durham, a, a famous speech called Fill Up the Jails, which was lost to history. The only record of it was the written record and then the, the eyewitness testimony. Um, but they were able to recreate that uh, environment on our uh, video walls um, using immersive um, kind of techniques and, and approaches and actually got the largest NEH grant in NC State's history. Now, NC State is primarily a, uh, uh, we're, a we're a comprehensive university, but our, our excellence is primarily in engineering, agriculture, textiles, areas like that. Um, but since the Hunt Library has been built, NC State for I think four years in a row now has received the largest NEH grant in the state of North Carolina as a predominantly non-humanities institution because 
we've been able to collaborate. It's because we have wonderful faculty that we hire, but also because they've been able to use the, and the Hunt Library has been written into every single one of those grants. Um, and it's because we can offer a, a unique mix of spaces and expertise in partnership with those faculty to create unique projects, which are gonna draw attention, draw funding, those kinds of things. Uh, and that has inevitably led us to immersive pedagogy and research through virtual reality, augmented reality. Um, this is another one of those NEH grants I mentioned. This is uh, Derek Ham is wearing a headset. He's a professor of design who specializes in virtual reality, um, who recreated the Memphis protests uh, where Martin Luther King was tragically shot at the end of those. Uh, and he runs students through a whole experience in that. He's done a lot of research uh, in those environments. And the obvious advantage of moving from walls to, to VR and AR is that we can move from a, a single space in time, right on a video wall, um, to a to a virtual reality environment that almost anybody, um, any researcher can um, can engage in. Um, we've got lots of hands-on making examples, lots of creative projects through 3D printing, um, through electronics, wearable electronics. Uh, you see a, a book that was turned into an electronic object there, augmented reality. Um, our hands-on making environments have been used uh, in research prototyping, rapid research prototyping. This is this is not anything new. It was new in 2013 when we built the Hunt Library, but you see makerspaces, um, you know, in libraries across the country. But they continue to to pay significant benefits for for digital scholarship um, environments. And the blending of virtual reality, augmented reality, and hands-on making in really interesting ways, um, I think, has really um, helped some of our researchers excel. Uh, interdisciplinary making and senior design, right? Digital scholarship is not just a, a research activity. If done right, it can be a, a very prominent student activity. The young woman there is a, is a, is a, a digital textiles uh, maker. So she makes electronic pulsating kind of dresses that that dress is a, called a pulse dress that that, um, that runs based on your the biorhythms of your body and your heart rate and all that kind of stuff, uh, which is either frightening or fascinating depending on, on how, you, how you take it. Um, I mentioned rapid, rapid prototyping you see this uh, there's a peanut butter jar it's a plastic uh, peanut butter jar with a twist that the senior design team worked on um, and they're they're licensing that for for uh, corporate use now um, basically twist the peanut butter up so you don't get your hands in it but the point is that it's bringing disciplines together business majors with computer scientists with humanists with communications majors right to do really interesting um, sort of hands-on digital scholarship uh, we're doing a lot with interactive media we've got several uh, dissertations and master's theses that are interactive uh, media based um, and these are all the kind of spaces that we have in the Hunt Library and now in our Hill Library. So everything from immersive visualization, large video walls, making virtual reality, interactive digital media, um, all of this becomes the, the suite of offerings that we can provide in a, in a digital scholarship environment. And then really crucially and, and more recently, data spaces for data science. The library has become the uh, physical, tangible sort of hub for data science activities on NC State's campus which is a huge opportunity. So that means we're being written into grants. Uh, we're, we're piloting a research concierge service with our Office of Research and our Office of Information Technology. We have expert data science consultants around the data space. Now you don't need the data space in order to do that, but I would say that the, the creation of a data space, a hub on campus where these things could be brought together um, has launched us, has placed us at the center of these conversations on campus and has helped us launch all of these follow on services that go with that space. Um, and again, the research concierge service, the data consulting, all those things aren't dependent on this space, but they're really enhanced by the space. And the space is what brought the people in and helped kind of change their perception of what the library could be. And it convinced the administration that the library could be the centerpiece of data science on NC State's campus. Uh, some of the challenges in building out all these spaces um, are initial lack of awareness about or, or really aw awareness isn't so much as command about wh how, to, how to make the sausage, right? Some faculty are really comfortable diving in, some researchers, some senior design students, those kind of, a lot of them are not. Um, so building that awareness, that capacity, that comfort in working with these spaces was important. Um, the demand that grows, uh, trying to keep up with that demand and related the expertise, the staffing expertise the evolution of your spaces and your staff expertise has to happen sort of in conjunction with each other. Ideally, the, actually the staffing expertise has to be ahead of your spaces so that you can 
build out the spaces and service them effectively. Um, but staffing expertise is an often underrated um, element of space design and build, um, but uh, really crucial to helping um, leverage those spaces to their full advantage. Uh, and then the other uh, challenge that we've had on campus is that we've built expectations up um, for the rest of campus and how to kind of provide and deal with that capacity um, and expectation growth um, is something that's been a real challenge at NC State. But in order to, as I've mentioned, in order to leverage these opportunities, um, you have to have the kind of the environment and the spaces and the technology, but you also got to have the expertise. You've got to have the programming, the events, the workshops that help bring people together. Uh, and I'll, I'll sort of uh, expand on that. One of the crucial elements that every library is doing now is our workshop portfolio, almost every library is the workshop portfolios have expanded significantly. Um, we're teaching skills, right? To uh, help researchers be more successful, be more productive, be more well known. Um, we're doing everything from uh, basic viz tools to elements of design to Tableau to our programming to Open Refine to GIS. This is just a sampling of workshops that we offer at NC State. Our workshop portfolio has grown by a thousand percent since we opened the Hunt Library. Um, you know, that's no accident. Right, the workshops help give people the skills to be able to work with the spaces and use the technologies and tools. Uh, but again, also the spaces help bring the people in so that then they can take the workshops. And of course you need the people to be able to teach these workshops. And that portfolio growth has been expansive and significant. It has not always been smooth and clean, but it's something that we've, well, that we've welcomed. Um, the relevance, the engagement, the connectivity with researchers in providing these things that they can't get um, elsewhere has been really crucial. Uh, programming. Uh, once a month we have a coffee and viz series where uh, a faculty member, a researcher, a graduate student talks about their visualization work that they're doing. Uh, it brings about 40 to 50 people from all kinds of disciplines. Again, this is on pause and actually has is now moved to, to online. We're doing our first one here this, I think this Friday or last Friday over Zoom. Uh, the coffees bring bring your own coffee now at this point but we used to provide bagels coffee put 40 people in a room in an immersive visualization room and talk about visualization and what the possibilities are and it started with um, uh, um, St. Paul's Cathedral which was burned down in London and the recreation of that um, but then the people involved in that got connected with coastal researchers on campus who now they're doing visual, um, they're, they've gotten a lot of NSF money to help visualize the erosion of coasts and the effects of climate change on um, physical landscaping in North Carolina and beyond all those kind of things. And there's several sort of follow on examples of that um, in terms of bringing people together around a space. And I'm sure Brian's going to talk about some of that as well. Uh, undergraduate research slams are now hosted in the libraries exclusively in our digital scholarship spaces, which is really wonderful. Brings a lot of faculty together, brings uh, undergraduate researchers together in normal times. It brings their parents and their families in to see what they're doing, which is really great for the university. Um, and then we have large scale programs like the uh, experience, the Martin, virtual Martin Luther King project that I mentioned. Uh, over the course of a weekend, we had several programs, um, including the virtual reality, the immersive um, um, visualization lab that you see here. Uh, over the course of a weekend, it brought in over a thousand people from the NC State community, from the community beyond. Um, if you think about the relevance of, of like what the research enterprise brings to a community, bringing people in, um, the publicity for the university, that was pretty incredible. Um, and, and we plan to host more of these kind of large, we've had several of these large scale events and they, and they typically draw hundreds to, to over a thousand people, which is really wonderful. Uh, and now I'm going to try to show you a video from a happening that we had um, here. I'm just going to, it's like a 15, 20 second clip, but I think it's really crucial and it illustrates my main, one of my main points here. Uh, let me see if I can get it to work. You know, the first time I talked to Susan, I, uh, Susan Nutter, I said, is there any way I could come to the library to work with your video walls? I said that about two years ago. Last year, I said something different. I said, is there any way I can come back to your library to work with your staff? Do you remember that? It's the staff that I'm after. This is a so I think that's the the crucial point that I want to share with you. That was David Silver. He's a he was a visiting scholar here from the University of San Francisco. He was talking to my predecessor, Susan Nutter, who's uh, the visionary behind a lot of our work um, and someone that, that I want to make sure I credit. Um, but he, 
he came for the walls, right? And he stayed for the staff. I think that's the best example I can I can show you of what these spaces do, right? He came because we had the walls, because we had the Hunt Library, but the value he got was because he worked with expert staff in order to create uh, this immersive um, research experience where he used the whole building um, in order to to talk about Black Mountain College and the 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 his research around Black Mountain College. What that means is we have to grow the capacity of our expertise and our staff, right? And I, I again, I can't emphasize that enough um, in terms of places and spaces plus expertise and staff, right? We've built community of practice. Um, I think you see, sometimes you see these spaces pop up and there's like one person or two people who are the experts around that. And, and that's great to get started, but it has to grow from there. And not just in the number of staff, but we have to grow the capacity across the staff. We have to have expectations, time, resources, peer learning, formal training opportunities. Um, and we have to allow staff to engage um, in the opportunities around digital scholarship and digital research and be able to participate in those in order to develop the kind of community of practice that, um, that I think we want to have um, in order to make these spaces successful. Uh, we've also done a lot with, with peer students. We hire, we have a lot of talented students. They do a lot of peer training. Um, we've put more and more money into to peer learning and peer training. Again, that's a little bit on pause right now. More, more than a little bit, it's big time on pause. Um, but that's been really successful, hiring like statistical grad students to help teach researchers and other graduate students and undergraduate students about the potential around spaces and around these emerging technologies. Some of the lessons that we've learned is, as I kind of wrap up um, is acknowledge the transition from what you had, whatever space you had um, to wherever you're going, sort of be very open and transparent about that transition. Reduce friction and barriers to use wherever you can. We over-engineered some of our spaces when we built our new library. We have since reduced some of those barriers. When we renovated our old library here recently, uh, we've built in less friction and less engineering and complexity into the spaces, which is important. But we're, we've also stayed bold and aspirational so we don't waste the opportunity. And again, the opening is just the midpoint. Um, and I've mentioned, I wanna say, I've mentioned several um, spaces in this talk. Uh, if you, you don't have to have several, you just have to have one. It could be a video wall, it could be a digital scholarship space that has multiple technologies. It could be, it could be almost any experimental space that has an emerging technology component included. It could be VR, virtual reality, augmented reality, whatever it is. If you can build more than one, that's great. If you can only build one, that's all it takes. Um, if you can build in the things like the programming, the workshops, the events, the expertise around it, um, you can you can move yourself forward. And if you build one and you do those things and you build momentum, again, what you'll find is that um, is that lots more opportunities uh, kind of come available. And then you too can become, uh, or you probably already are, but even more, you can become an expander uh, of the possible um, for faculty. So that's all I had, Joan. I'll stop my sharing here I think if that works or do you want me to keep it up uh, you can you can keep it up for okay. now if you'd like uh, Greg that was fantastic as always and I loved your final point um, because as you know I'm a tremendous fan of the hunt library but whenever I talk to people about hunt I always say and visit hill as well because not most um, academic uh, institutions aren't going to have the funding to build a new facility like Hunt, but lots of them have facilities like Hill and look what you've done in your renovations and expanding opportunities and doing all kinds of things there and it doesn't take an entire building. It can be a room or several rooms or some screens or other things to start to build a program. I appreciate your saying that. So we do have a few questions to start off in the chat. One is very straightforward. Uh, I think someone was in a way salivating over all the workshops that you're offering virtually now. And are they now open to everyone, even those not affiliated with NC State and may those outside the, the state sign up and attend? Uh, no, uh, unfortunately, they're only NC State community right now. Um, but we the interesting have a waiting list for those. Yeah, but the interesting thing is that we we have capped those still, but the cap is bigger than it was when we were in person. Uh -huh. So that's something that we're gonna we're gonna pivot when even when we can offer them in person is we've been able to accommodate more people with the online, and we've been able to do more asynchronously. So um, even though they're not open to other people. Um, it is an example of how learning through the pandemic, uh, we're gonna offer them differently um, 
moving forward. Still, still in conjunction with the space, but some more online and more asynchronous activities. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is, can you elaborate a bit about the library serving as a campus data science hub? And that's from Diane Goldenberg Hart at CNI. Yeah, we, um, there's an interdisciplinary um, school of data science that's being created at NC State and um, the library is going to be the, the physical hub of that. Uh, there's going to be statistical consulting services in biomedicine, geographic information, um, core statistics and computer science that are going to be housed out of the, the data spaces at each of the main libraries, high performance computing um, activities uh, and, and hardware. Um, that's not ubiquitously available on campus are going to be at each of the main libraries. But really, I think the key there is there are going to be graduate students and librarians uh, in, in experts in data science who are going to be available to faculty to help assist them with um, research questions, research problems that they're trying to launch. Um, um, so it's going to be the sort of crossroads for the community there, which I think is really important. If I had to pick one, actually, and I would launch a data space or some kind of data science space with a with some kind of large video visual component like what Brian's going to talk about. Like if I had to pick one out of these, that's that's what I would pick because the opportunities around that, um, uh, the the library being a hub for data science on campus is those are uh, pretty uh, amazing to think about for us. Yeah, and I think um, in part it's because data science can uh, in, incorporate data in the humanities and the social sciences and the sciences. Uh, so it, it really can be cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary. Uh, let's, That's right. Yeah. The questions keep coming. So uh, this is an interesting uh, uh, question. Can you talk about some of the areas of friction that you reduced with the new design? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the the software that people had to interact with in order to get their materials up onto the screens uh, was simplified. We built a web-based interface for that um, to make it easier to use. Um, the the server infrastructure, um, uh, we used a, a overly complex piece of hardware that I can't remember what it was and replaced it with a much simpler piece of hardware. Uh, too many projectors, uh, too many video walls. We actually cut the number of video walls down by one because they were like all different sizes and shapes. Um, so, the, so those are some of the elements. But basically what it, we did is we made it easier for someone who had digital content to get it onto the walls and less intermediary uh, expertise in between it. Um, because A, that would frustrate people and B, there's only so much expertise that a library can provide for people. Um, so um, it was really the software and systems in between someone's content and getting it on the wall that we just really simplified and made it much more web-based um, interface in order for people to do that. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what does the graduate student employment model look like? What are their job expectations? How are they compensated? For example, uh, a wage, tuition waiver, et cetera. Yeah, they're, um, these are primarily hourly based, um, but they make um, 20 to $25 an hour, which is a pretty good wage. Um, it's typically in addition to or outside, like uh, around their assistantship if they have one. Um, but we do have now four assistantships, two digital humanists and two com computer science statistician assistantships that are like full on total tuition waiver, um, you know, salary based. Um, and, and so there's a mix of, of sort of permanent, quote unquote, permanent half-time graduate students, PhD and master's students in the spaces, and then hourly students, which are hired for, to try to have a variety of skills. So, so some of it's hourly, some of it's built into the assistantship program through the graduate school. Um, their expectations are to serve as expert consultants, be available, triage, things like that. And they're supervised by data science librarians. Uh, the next question, which uh, is, could you please share more about the process of developing expertise and capacity across your staff and any recommendations or lessons learned? Yeah, um, we, we, we created our own um, data and visualization boot camp, um, which I didn't create. Other folks on, on, in our staff um, created it, um, which we've sent, since folded into the um, library carpentry um, opportunities um, and allowed our staff to go through library carpentry. Um, and then there are uh, weekly peer workshops, share with a peer, um, where, fac where librarians will, will share um, tools, techniques, 
uh, software things that they're using in their own digital scholarship activity. Um, the advice I would have on creating those are, are find early adopters who are willing to lead the way, give them some time to lead the way, maybe give them a sprinkling of money if you can to buy coffee or bagels or a little bit of software or something like that. Um, and just try to create a community of practice, reward those librarians for it. Um, you know, I think sometimes um, as leaders, we, we, we get impatient with the, the pace of change, but we don't give people the time uh, and the reward and incentive infrastructure to, um, 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 to make those changes. Um, so giving people time, rewards, and some training opportunities, both internal and external, was kind of how we built that community of practice. Well, this has been um, a topic that has come up in numerous of the webinars. There is a one webinar and there's a recording about staffing where some of that is directly addressed. But I really appreciate your insight, Greg, because I think um, that you've done such a tremendous job um, at your libraries. Okay, one more question and then we'll move on to Brian. Uh, the question is, as spaces and services continue to develop, who does NC State Libraries look to for inspiration outside of libraries? That's a good question. Oh, that is a great question. Who do we look to for inspiration outside of um, libraries? I mean, I think there's the obvious, like we look at the, the kind of Googles of the world. We look at um, stat, uh, SAS, which is a statistical consulting software system, uh, is right down the road here and was founded out of NC State. So we're fortunate that we've got them right down the road. We look a lot at what they're doing. Uh, but we look a lot at what uh, other libraries are doing too, because there's a lot that like, um, you know, everything from uh, like, I, I'm always looking at what Brian's doing. And I'm not just saying that because he's next on the call. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't have to be, you know, Georgia State's a different kind of place than NC State. It's research enterprise is different. But there's all kinds of cool stuff. I was looking at Purdue's website the other day. Um, we look at a lot of different libraries. And we what we do is we try to mine for different things that are going on. We look at Australian and European libraries are, are doing lots of interesting things. And, and I know, Joan, you're always a a proponent of looking outside of the continental kind of US perspective, um, which we try to do. Well, we have to do it now totally remotely. Um, but we, we primarily look at large um, corporate activities that are going on in the VR space, in the data science space, those kinds of things. Greg, thank you so much. And we really appreciate your perspectives, your expertise, and your willingness to uh, tackle all those great questions. So if you'll end your screen share, yeah. we'll go on to Brian and ask him to share his slides and welcome Brian Sinclair. Give me one second. What, hello, yeah. Joan, give me one second here and I will. Okay. Well, thank you. Am I, am I up and running? Everything look good? All right. Yes, you are, Brian. Okay, you. great. Um, thank you so much, Joan, Diane, uh, Beth, and Greg, everybody. And Greg, I appreciate your words. Um, I can't tell you how much uh, and what an inspiration NC State Libraries has been to, to me and to my colleagues and I'm sure many people on the call. So uh, I, I'll jump right into this by stating, uh, a, I'm going to give a quote that I heard from an architect who was visiting us not too long ago. I believe he was from Cooper Robertson Architects in New York City. Uh, we've had many or uh, multiple uh, 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 master plan, uh, master planning activities happening both in the library and on campus. But he said, uh, and, I, and I don't think this is uh, uh, his quote, but he said, if you've been to one university, you've been to one university. And um, I think that's very true. Um, I think some of the things we're going to talk about today, um, you may find something at your own home institution that you can use, but it's very, it's very true. There are three research universities uh, close by here. We're so different in, in our missions and the students we serve. But um, I think there's a lot here we, we, can, uh, we, we have in common. So um, let me jump right into this and talk about flexibility in design and um, being responsive to your campus. And um, I'm going to use Curve, which is a space in our library. Uh, it's about 3,300 square feet, uh, approximately 60 to 70 users, um, according to the fire marshal, can be in there at a time. Um, it does have a center. Uh, and let me give you, tell you a little bit about its mission real quick. Um, it's an acronym 
collaborative university research and visualization environment. It's a technology risk rich discovery space. I was using the term discovery space long before I guess our electronic vendors decided we have discovery tools. I've always thought of spaces as being discovery spaces in libraries and, and a big, big proponent of having a physical space for discovery uh, where research and digital scholarship happens. And it is our mission to enhance, um, and I'm sorry the window's in the way, research and visualizations by providing technology and spaces to promote interdisciplinary engagement, collaborative investigation, and innovative inquiry. So that was our mission. Uh, from the very beginning. Uh, the centerpiece technology is a 24 foot video wall. Uh, it was recently refreshed in, last summer, new hardware, new so software, and uh, our partner is a, a tech vendor here in Atlanta. So that makes it very convenient to keep the wall running. It does run 24 seven and has been running for six years. Um, it is touch enabled and easy to use. And that was probably our, our most important consideration and having this is that it just operate like a giant um, touch screen and, uh, and with a Windows PC connected to it. And that still remains true today. Um, of course, Curve is more than a video wall. It's uh, collaborative spaces. There are, there are eight uh, collaborative workspaces throughout the, the space. And uh, this is a group of students doing some sort of group projects. I remember these days. These were wonderful days. Look forward to these days uh, again. Um, uh, most of them are, are movable, configurable. There are a few that uh, are less so, such as this one. So that was some background. So we've been open six years. I believe Hunt Library has been open seven years. Um, six years, so what is working? And I hope some of the things I say are gonna, are gonna, are gonna actually, I'm gonna borrow a lot from what Greg was saying um, in some ways, and then talk about some of the unique things that are to my university. So what's working? Uh, this is Bill Gates uh, visiting our campus to, to learn about some of our research and uh, predictive analytics and student success. And uh, of course, when he was here, they brought him to Curve because it's a showcase space. I believe Greg used that term. It is a place, it's attractive. There's our, our, the gold dome of our state capitol there in the background. Um, it's where visiting scholars, VIPs, et cetera, can come and, and showcase uh, their research. The space itself is a showpiece. Um, it's a space where grad students can showcase their research that's happening. Sorry, there's a library announcement happening about uh, social distancing right now. So if you could just give me a second for the announcement to end. <laughs> we have to put announcements on our PA system regularly to remind students not to uh, work in groups. You know, I'll keep talking over it. So um, students can showcase their work. This grad student is in public health. He's showing one of his uh, GIS projects. Um, this is a, a CT scan technologist from a local hospital. We have a hospital right next door to our campus. Uh, he's showing how he uses CT scans in his work. It's a guest lecture for some human anatomy pre-med students. This is an archaeologist uh, giving a, a virtual tour of some Mayan ruins down in Chiapas, Mexico. Uh, this is a group of digital humanists and heritage preservationists talking about the lost architecture of Atlanta and uh, they are the people here represent various disciplines. There's even, a, I believe, a geographer there. Um, this is a team of geologists from multiple universities who came for a, a meetup, uh, annual meeting to, to explore some of the latest technology in their field. And uh, this is a faculty pop-up club, which we have in Curve. This is a, a, some, a faculty member from our School of Public Health uh, talking about uh, vaccines, very relevant today. So showcase space, continues to be one of our main uh, roles that we play on our campus. Um, what else is working? Uh, being a data science hub. This is very similar to what Greg was talking about. Our research data services continue, continue to expand. Our portfolio and number of workshops may not be up a thousand percent, I believe is what Greg said, but it's close to it. We provide workshops such as this in vivo workshop. This is our team leader for research data services and that's the URL if you'd like to explore more. Um, this is our, let me get a drink of water, our, um, one of our many workshops on data services that we provide. Um, this is a, a meetup of R users. Uh, uh, this is an R support group. They're using R Studio. And this gives you an idea of some of the workshops we provide in the library from some of our digital signs in a typical week. Uh, Python, R, Tableau, 
Uh, I mean, Greg mentioned those very popular growing because employers say they're interested in students having uh, skills in those with that software. And this is a full list of the uh, software tools and uh, data, anal data analysis methods uh, training we provide. I believe on our website right now, you'll see workshops happening in the evening and the day, and they continue to grow both uh, in numbers and in a, a variety. Um, web scraping, web, uh, web data, social media APIs, uh, scraping media from uh, Twitter, it's popular, data cleaning, uh, and I mentioned R and Python uh, seem to be growing in popularity. So strengths, where are our strengths? The, it's a uh, curve remains a showcase space. It's for it's where interdisciplinary connections and meetups happen. It's where specialized software training happens. Uh, and then the data hub where our research data happens. The campus it is beginning to see the library as a place where students can get help with uh, statistics with using the software for data analysis and visualization. Less so, and this is going to be very surprising, and I'll try to talk more about this. Again, if you've been to one university, you've been to one university. Um, what is on the decline? Making, 3D, make, 3D modeling and printing, VR, AR gaming, and this is the most surprising one, digitization and digital projects creation. Um, this, and there's a little footnote there, this has moved to the back of the house. So if you think of the library as a restaurant, Curve is kind of the front of the house where the food is served and the presentation happens. But, and I think Greg also mentioned the sausage being made. That's the back of the house. Curve is a very visible, visual space and um, the work that students are doing is happening in other spaces. Um, although when the work is to be presented, Curve is the, is the first choice. Let's, let's schedule a presentation in Curve and show off what we've done. I will talk more about this, but I want to make sure I made, I made that point early on. So some reasons why the library is not a maker space and why we're not a gaming space and why some of these uh, services have moved elsewhere. Um, my colleagues in central IT have created this, these wonderful X labs on our campus, um, collaboration spaces. They have state of the art 3D printers, laser cutters, Spaces designed specifically for VR um, and AR uh, development and um, spaces that are designed to move about in, in a safe way in curve that never really worked very well. Uh, you could bump into furniture or a glass wall or something uh, unpleasant like that. So these X lab spaces have, and there's one in one of our libraries actually, but it is not run by us. They have opened in the last two or three years and are a wonderful resource for our students. In fact, we're a great partner with them. We have opened a Cre Creative Media Industries Institute on in our campus where video, uh, video, uh, video game development, VR, AR, et cetera, is, is encouraged. And there are spaces not only for students in that program, but for others. One of our maker spaces is in this space. It reminds me a great deal, uh, it, or at least I think it borrowed some design elements from the Hunt Library. You'll notice the, the video wall there on the left. And it is open uh, late evenings in a very central vis visible location on campus. These are wonderful things though. The library was first it, with Curve and these other wonderful spaces have followed and, and they're, um, it's, it's just wonderful to have to be part of a, a, a campus that is interested in creativity and innovation. Um, this is also in our Creative Media Industries Institute. This looks very familiar to me. Let me catch up to my notes to um, the teaching and visualization lab in Hunt. Not quite as nice, but it, it gets at that idea. This is a space on our campus that is for the students in the program, but can be used by other students as well. And last but not least, other departments, colleges and schools have opened their own uh, learning labs. Again, this is all very good and, and uh, we're, we're very happy to partner with these. This is uh, in our College of Business. It's a, there are some collaborative stations in the back, but our history department has opened a digital uh, humanities type lab as, as, as our uh, political science department has opened a GIS lab for their students. So these are all great uh, developments on campus that we welcome, but they also require us to change and to evolve. Now this is one of the original diagrams of Curve uh, when we first opened in 2014. And I, there are a few things here that are odd to me. There's a Linux workstation space. There's actually a room for the Linux workstation, which was never really used and, and was probably abandoned after the first year. But it was something that our researchers said they wanted and we were in tune with their needs and, and responsive. Um, and there is a 3D modeling workstation. It may be hard to see on your screen on the very top left. Um, 
This is the diagram from last year. This is the diagram changes. There is a photogrammetry studio. There is a VR development workstation and there are 3D scanning stations in the upper left. Those have since been replaced by our research data services, which I'll talk about in a minute. And we've prided ourselves from the very beginning that Curve could accommodate pop-up, what I call pop-up um, labs. This is a pop-up digitization uh, space. The student is making a 3D model of a book as an artifact. Uh, and of course, we took the room and reconfigured it for the class and for the student's needs. This is a student doing a photogrammetry, uh, making a model uh, of, a, of a mesh purse for her class on flappers in the 1920s. And she was making a model and was gonna put it in her Omeka website and, and talk about um, fashion in the 1920s. But a little pop-up area there for that type of work. And uh, we even had 3D, and I've shown this before to see in our presentation, uh, human organs in Curve, where we, this was another room where we modified it to, uh, students could bring in an ice chest with human organs and they made 3D models of different body parts. Um, I will explain the baby powder, it's to take the shine or the sheen off of the, the organs so that it makes a better scan. And those students would present and showcase their 3D models in a class presentation and invite the community and the campus in. So let, let me talk about, let me get into the weeds real quick for the next five minutes on design thinking and how we're able to pivot very quickly from one type of space to another type of space by retaining those, those key uh, um, services that we still provide. So this is from one of the last charrettes, um, a design meetings for Curve. And one of our guiding principles, design principles, was the idea of showcase. And again, Greg used that term. But um, the sight lines, so that when you're in our lobby, you can see what's happening. You see activity. You see students interacting. You see faculty. You see um, Bill Gates or, um, or, or some other famous person, if, we can, if we're lucky to get them. You, you can see activity. It's not a place to, to uh, sequester yourself. It's a place where you, you put it all out there. So that, I think that factors into this, um, maybe the, some of the changes we're seeing. Um, even so, even this, I showed this image at the beginning, the glass wall will open and for larger groups, so we can really invite people to come in and, and be immersed in this visual um, research and, and projects that are happening. This is actually a, a stacking partition system that um, is outside of Curve. And we open it on occasion when there's just too many people in the space. And a shout out to our architects, Cooper, uh, Collins Cooper Carusi here in Atlanta. They've done a lot of projects for us and, and also with our colleagues at Emory and Georgia Tech. Um, I could not find a picture of a large uh, event in Curve where we opened the glass wall, but I found a picture of one where we should have opened the glass wall. So this is one that shows clearly the fire marshal would have gotten onto us, but there was some sort of presentation happening and, and we've got a lot of people in there. Again, uh, I long for these days to return. So uh, I'll pause for a second to mention that our design and planning is all uh, documented at this URL. Uh, I'll be glad if anyone wants to reach out to me afterward to, to talk about any of the, the FF&E or the, or the, or the uh, hardware or, or the uh, furnishings that we, we purchased six years ago. Glad to, to have all that. I have it, I have it all uh, uh, readily available. Um, this is a diagram of the uh, electrical uh, one of our meetings around electrical uh, and uh, uh, the fiber optics and the uh, uh, CAT6 connections. Um, there is a lot of data in the space, which allows for a lot of flexibility. Along this, this wall here, you can see the power in the data. That means a workstation can go there. Most of the workstations that I mentioned are configurable and, can, and these small group consultations, these are some of our data librarians, these small group consultations do seem to be one of our most, more, more popular, if not most popular activities. And this will show you the mullion, the horizontal mullion there. I'm um, getting in the weeds, but you might be interested in this. So that you can plug in here or here, anywhere down this wall and move your workstation. And it's at a, a, a more comfortable height than being on the floor. There's another angle. And of course, all the workstations, uh, PC towers are on these movable carts. Many of you have seen these. It does allow for a lot of flexibility and impromptu and uh, small group uh, consultations and workshops. 
Um, let me talk very quickly to, as I wrap up about the wall itself, the interact wall that appears to be free floating here in the, uh, the space. That was intentional. This is an image from the back of the wall. It has a, like a wire mesh that kind of protects all the, the, uh, the wires and everything, but also allows for accessibility. It's another image. But one thing that it did do is it allowed for a space behind the wall to give a little bit more privacy for small groups such as this one, where they can actually do more focused work, 10 to 12 students. Um, this is one of the more popular spaces because it's less visible. It's behind the wall, you can, but you're still, you're still there and you can, it's still a dynamic open space, but you have a little bit more privacy to work on your project. And uh, LibCal spaces, many of you who work in libraries are familiar with the suite of, uh, of uh, software provided by our friends at SpringShare. It has been a wonderful uh, thing since the very beginning. Every workstation, including the wall itself, are bookable by students using LibCal spaces and with no mediation from us. Except for the wall, we do sometimes ask them, what is this for? Um, just to kind of to govern it a bit. But the wall is, is available to any student, faculty or staff member to book um, and to uh, use um, as they wish. And uh, I want to make sure I mentioned that having very nice PCs, high-end PCs with, with nice GPUs is, is a draw uh, uh, for researchers, uh, for students working on any number of projects. That was the, probably the first draw uh, that brought most people in. The, the wall was secondary. It was having these very nice PCs for students to, to uh, use into the evening hours. So my last slide, and I hope I'm on time as I wrap up here, because there's a lot of content. I want to, I want to reiterate the built-in flexibility for our users and the flexibility in our philosophy that we remain responsive to campus needs. Uh, we, fill, we find those gaps, as, as Dean uh, Jeff Steely here at our libraries would say, we find those gaps and we attempt to fill them. We provide specialized software and hardware. Uh, we, we are responsive in, in software that students need. If it's specialized software that's not on the campus image or in our labs, we're, we, we will actually work to get that installed and curve quickly. Uh, uh, we uh, remain true to our mission as a research and visualization space. Um, we continue to hire librarians with specialized skills, but more and more in the data uh, science, data services area. And, uh, we, and I think Joan mentioned this a minute ago, uh, data transcends the sciences and the social sciences. Data can be photographs, maps, uh, numeric data. They may be seen as the building blocks for digital scholarship. And uh, the data tools we teach help facilitate the creation of these projects. And so to wrap up, our master plan does uh, look, we are uh, working toward moving our data science hub to Curve. And uh, because it's visual and there's some office spaces adjacent to Curve that we plan to repurpose. So probably by the next time I talk about Curve, it will be our research data hub, uh, our research science, uh, science data hub for the campus. So I think that's about it. That was a lot of information, but it was fun to talk about it. And uh, thank you all for having me again. It was wonderful. Thank you so much, Brian. Yes, it was a lot of information. I think the interesting thing for me, and you and I talked in advance about the changes, is from what I could see, the space itself hasn't changed that much. It's the activities in the space, which says a lot for the design. We talk about flexibility, but in this sense, the flexibility wasn't moving things around. It was that the initial design enabled you to do all kinds of things in that space. So that, that was quite interesting. We do have some questions ready. And the first one is regarding the data science services. How do these services interact with or distinct with from other services or programs related to data science on campus. And actually you had several areas where there was overlap or potential overlap with other uh, areas on campus. Well, um, there are data uh, in science and data science intensive uh, majors uh, programs developing, but we complement them. Uh, the, the library, true to our mission, we serve all students. So it could be the sociology uh, master's student who needs some help with using a statistical software. It could be the business major wanting to use uh, some mark, do some marketing research. We complement um, any existing programs on campus. 
and I would add, we, we are open uh, in the evenings and we have data librarians who, uh, who provide workshops and one-on-one -on -one consultations into the evening. So we, I think these programs of value that we fill those gaps, we are there for uh, all students. So I don't, there's no competition there. In fact, I think we're welcome. We're welcome in that, um, that arena. Thank you. The next question is, how do you manage the pop-up digitization studio? Are there parameters for requesting the pop-up studio? Is there a particular librarian who oversees it? Does it change location in the space based on availability or does it generally only pop up in one specific location? Yeah, so that was past tense. I was giving some examples. I'm gonna make, make sure I was clear of, of things that we used to do. You know, a lot of that is driven, before I answer the question, by certain faculty members and certain librarians who have are passionate about this type of work. Uh, we had a couple of researcher, uh, I'm sorry, it's, uh, instructors on our campus who were in, incorporating photogrammetry and this type of 3D modeling in their work. They have since moved on to other uh, positions. Uh, and so we, the, the governing of that was uh, really, there was a librarian who was interested in it and they kind of over, they provide the overseeing uh, of that. But uh, we do not provide that uh, and we do not advertise that anymore. Um, there are much better spaces, better equipped spaces on campus for that type of work now. Thank you. And please continue to type questions in the chat. I, I want to ask um, one of the things I enjoyed seeing uh, a few years ago uh, in a presentation you gave were hackathons that students held in your space. Does that still go on? Do you have other student activities? Yes. They, well, they'll have their, there's a Panther Hackers, they call their, their a group. They've become more organized. They were a grassroots type of group and we were their home base for a while. Um, they have since moved on to bigger and better spaces, but if they do like a, pre, uh, a competition, uh, they, they always come ask if, if they can do it in curve. But yes, we uh, were the home for the hackers for a while. Um, we, we have really seen a lot of growth on our campus in these innovative type collaborative spaces. And I like to feel like we are part, we were part of that, um, provided the, you know, the, 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 the seeds, planted the seeds for that. Or, um, but uh, yes, they, they're still uh, a, a fixture. We know the Panther Hackers, but they, are, they have moved on to other spaces. Thank you. Uh, any questions for either Greg or Brian, please type into the chat. I, I'm going to ask both of you a question about the use of the term digital scholarship. I really um, kind of argue with myself about the use of that term, um, especially since in this series, I very much wanted to incorporate the sciences and the new types of services and programs and expertise libraries are providing. Um, for data, data intensive work in the sciences, not just the social sciences and humanities. And do you think that the digital scholarship, the term um, is kind of uh, beyond value at this point? Is it losing its value? Or if it had value in your on your own campus? Greg, you look ready to say something. <laughs> I, I think it's become too synonymous with the digital humanities, yes. Uh -huh. um, now, if that is not a problem on your campus, then it's not a big deal at all. Um, probably Brian and I, given the, the both of our institutions, we probably like wouldn't like totally want to lean into that. Um, but, but on the other hand, there's also the chance to kind of reclaim it as more of an interdisciplinary right crossroads, which is what I think the spirit of this these talks is. Much you know, I've, I've been enjoying the the sort of suite of them and. Um, so I guess it depends on institutional context, but yeah, we, we you tend to use like research infrastructure or digital research and scholarship just to try to broaden our tent a little bit um, because it's become a little bit more narrow, at least in our profession. So that's Thank my you. thought, yeah. Brian, yeah. comment? I, yeah, the same. I, I will say that the reason we didn't lean into digital scholarship as much at the beginning is it was harder to explain. Uh, we were, the libraries were reporting up to the VP for research at the time. So we really focused on the undergraduate research, the researcher and visual data visualization and that type of thing. But uh, yeah, it, it, it was just harder to explain. Of course, our colleagues down the road here at Emory, it's, 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 it's part of their, uh, it's baked into their, their campus culture. 
that, that center there is known for, and they are known for their digital humanities and digital scholarship work. It would just have been a harder sell here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Joan. Oh, you please add to that, and then I'll go on to another question. Well, I was gonna say, I, I'm seeing questions come in about um, like deduplicating services yeah. and campus exactly. context and stuff. And, and one thing I was just gonna pick up on that, that I think is pretty crucial, uh, and both Brian and I, I think reflect this is um, I'm a big fan of, of sort of trading space for partnerships or relevance or sort of thinking about space in terms of partnerships. And um, so to answer some of those questions, one of the ways we went about kind of deduplicating and thinking about things is to invite partners in, right? Invite the duplication into the building and then kind of work together um, and use the transformational opportunities around library spaces from stacks to whatever. Um, to bring campus partners in and to work, we've worked really closely with our Office of Information Technology and Office of Research, right, in order to strategically position and partner our services um, around that. And I, Brian's talk was peppered with with partnerships and collaborations and those kinds of things. So I think thinking about space in terms of what the university needs. Now, you know, I say that and I had somebody who wanted to put like a server farm in one of our floors of our stacks. It's like, that's like taking beachfront property and building a storage unit. That's a terrible idea. So you have to pick good ideas and good partners. But I, I think that's a big trend in terms of that answers some of those questions. Yeah, Brian, anything to add? Thank you, Greg. Absolutely. Um, the turf wars, uh, that, that's, 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 that's the past. We, we, we gained so much more through collab. Now, a server farm, right, in the stacks, no. But, um, the, our, our center for teaching and learning is right below curve. It's a very dynamic space. Again, I didn't mention that space, but it, if, a, if a faculty member wants to create some dynamic video content or, or, or work with an a, a instructional designer, they're right below us. And uh, there are times where I say, you really need to go down there. I mean, that's, that's, there's, that's their expertise. I think we support research at all levels and they support teaching at all levels. And then there's, there's some overlap. And that's the fun part when they overlap, actually. Thank you. You know, we're at the end of the hour and I'm going to formally end the program. However, uh, if you have the time, please stay on and we will get to their couple of questions remaining in the chat and other uh, individuals can ask questions in the chat or verbally once we end the recording. Uh, so I want to give a big thank you to both Greg and Brian for just outstanding talks and such great information for all of us. And thank you to all the participants. Please note that we're departing from our Tuesday, Thursday pattern this week. We will not have a webinar this Thursday. Our next and final webinar is on Tuesday, October 13th, and will feature a panel format where three individuals with deep experience in digital scholarship will reflect on libraries and digital scholarship, and will also look ahead to the future. Mm -hmm.